Hello. Today we are going to walk through a short presentation on PAD, the PadNet device, patient preparation and insurance, testing protocol, and a brief description of some of our other services here at Biomedics. First, I want to talk a bit about PAD to give some context as to what we are trying to combat here at Biomedics. PAD, or peripheral artery disease, is a vascular disease where the buildup of plaque in the arteries causes a blockage or reduction of blood flow, particularly in the legs. As more blood is blocked, more oxygen is deprived from the lower extremities. This lack of oxygenation can lead to a number of more extreme medical conditions. And PAD is very prevalent in the United States. We see 8 to 12 million Americans living with PAD. That includes one-third of smokers over the age of 50, one-third of diabetics over the age of 50, and one-third of patients over the age of 70, regardless of any other risk factors. And we see a strong correlation between PAD and heart disease. We see 75% of people with PAD having heart disease, which is part of why we are so interested in trying to find patients that have PAD. And also, we see that the mortality rate is over 30% within five years, so we want to make sure we find patients with this condition early before their PAD leads to more severe problems and situations. As I mentioned before, many patients are asymptomatic for extended periods of time, but as more plaque begins to build up and the severity of their PAD increases, we see symptoms such as claudication pain or exercise pain begin to develop. From there, we see the development of resting pain, and as more oxygen is deprived from the leg tissue, we see the formation of ulcers and gangrenous tissue. Of course, as these more extreme conditions come about, one of the most common procedures we see patients with PAD receiving is amputation. We here at Biomedics are working very hard to reduce the number of amputations in the United States because of some of these alarming statistics. We see, for example, over 2 million people in the United States living with an amputation, and over half of them are due to vascular disease. We also see that over half the people who have one leg amputated will need the second leg amputated within three years. And lastly, I want to point out that over half of the people who have an amputation at all will die within five years. Now, particularly that last one can come from a number of cases. That's either because of the condition that necessitated the amputation or because of the procedure of an amputation itself since it's such a risky procedure. So the more we can do to catch PAD in patients before these conditions that lead to amputation occur, the more limbs we save and the more lives we save. Lastly, if we look at the mortality rate of PAD compared to some major cancers, we see that the mortality rate of PAD is three times greater than that of breast cancer and greater than the combined mortality rate of prostate cancer, breast cancer, and Hodgkin's disease. And we see that it is just shy of the mortality rate of colon and rectal cancer. Now I want to talk a bit about risk factors for PAD. Risk factors for PAD are symptoms that a patient shows that put them at high risk for PAD, but are not sufficient symptoms to be reimbursed by insurance for a full arterial study. So some common risk factors include diabetes, smoking, high blood pressure, high lipid content, patients with discolored or pale feet, uh, absent foot pulses, history of kidney disease, and history of heart disease. Now, if patients arrive with a risk factor, we advise clinics do a number of things. The first is to provide them with the PAD questionnaire. This is a questionnaire compiled by doctors that sums up the symptoms of many indications for PAD. And so a positive answer to any of these questions is emblematic of that patient showing the symptoms of an indication for PAD. The second thing that we offer clinics to do is PAD screenings. Now a screening is just a PVR at either ankle, or PVRs at both ankles, and you examine the abnormality of either ankle. We'll talk a bit more about what this means as we talk about the device testing later on. If either PVR in the ankle appears abnormal, then that screening becomes an indication for PAD and can be used to get reimbursed by insurance. Now lastly, if a patient comes in with an indication for PAD, that means that they have a symptom that is worthy of being reimbursed by insurance for conducting a full arterial study. Common indications for PAD include claudication, leg pain, rest pain, ulcers, gangrene, Raynaud's, diabetes with circulatory complications, which is different than just diabetes. Diabetes on its own is a risk factor. If the diabetic, can, if the diabetic patient has circulatory complications as a result of their diabetes, that is considered an indication. And then lastly, we see lower extremity embolism or thrombosis as a common indication for PAD. 
Now I'm going to talk briefly about the types of measurements that our device records in order to look at patients for PAD. The first of two measurements that we look at is what's called an ABI, or an ankle brachial index. The ABI is the patient's systolic blood pressure at each ankle divided by the blood pressure at each arm. Now in a healthy patient, we want to see the blood pressure be either the same or slightly higher in the lower part of the body because of gravity. And so what we consider the normal ABI range is a range of 1 to 1.4. That's 1 saying that the ratio is 1 to 1, or 1 1.4 saying that the lower body is slightly higher than the upper body. Now, as we start to see that ratio tip the other way and get less than one, that means that there is more plaque that's blocking blood flow to the legs, causing the blood pressure to decrease because the volume of blood is lower. Now from there, as it begins to decrease to a greater and greater degree, the severity increases to where if it's less than 0.5, we consider that a severe ABI reading. Now you'll notice that we have this range up here called non-compressible. This is essentially an inconclusive range or a false positive range, and that results in patients that have calcification of their blood vessels or anything else that would cause their blood vessels to be too rigid for us to trust the compression pressure that was required. This is essentially like trying to compress clay pipes, and so in this case if we get something that's greater than 1.4 it is a false positive and we consider it inconclusive. This is part of why we also include in our study a PVR which is the second of two measurements. The PVR is a pulse volume recording, and this is a waveform analysis of the volume of blood entering and exiting the vessel. We record this volume waveform analysis using the blood pressure cuffs that we place above the knee, on the calf, the ankles, and or the toes. Here are some sample PVR waveforms so that we can go through the breakdown between normal to critical. In a normal PVR, we see a sharp intake of blood as the ventricles contract, followed by a relatively sharp decrease in blood volume. And then we see the presence of what's called a diacrotic notch. Now this occurs when the semilunar valves close behind and provide a little extra kick in the blood as it goes through the circulatory system. So again, we'll see a sharp intake from the ventricles contracting, a minor notch, called the diacrotic notch, and then a return to the baseline. Now this diacrotic notch can be present either as a perfect secondary peak or as simply another change of rate. So it goes sharp down, sometimes it'll go up a little bit and back down, but generally we want to see this nice diacrotic notch. Now as that diacrotic notch begins to go away, we consider it mildly abnormal because it means that there's enough plaque for us to lose the nuance of that volume of blood and it's sort of getting streamlined, but we're still getting the general peaks and valleys of it. So from there, as the diacrotic notch begins to go away, we go from normal to mild abnormality. Now from there, as the amplitude of those waves begin to decrease, that means more and more blood is being blocked. And therefore, as it approaches a flat line, we approach a critical PVR analysis. Here's an example of how a patient might be laid out with all of our cuffs and what each cuff is responsible for recording during our tests. Our arm pressure cuffs are just used for recording blood pressure, and these record blood pressures for the ABIs and the complementary measurement, the TBI, which is the same as the ankle brachial index, except it uses the blood pressure in the toes instead of the ankles. Our thigh and calf cuffs can be used for recording segmental pressures, however we rarely see doctors requesting segmental blood pressures, so most commonly we see them being used for PVRs. In addition to the thighs and the calves, the ankle cuffs are also used for PVRs, but the ankle cuffs also record blood pressure to complement the arm blood pressure for the ankle brachial index. And similarly to the ankles, the toe cuffs are used for both PVRs and pressures to get toe PVRs and TBIs. Here's a brief breakdown of some of the major procedure codes that we see applied to the tests that our device can do. Most commonly, we see the 93923, which is the full arterial study. A full arterial study consists of an ABI or the complementary TBI, and PVRs at three levels. Most commonly, we see this at above the knee, the calf, and the ankle. Now, for example, if you have a patient with major open wounds on their thigh and you, can't, and you don't want to put a cuff over it, you are able to instead look at the calf, ankle, and toes. So you just need three of the four possible levels, as long as they're the same on both sides. So it has to be both calves, both ankles, and both toes. It can't be one thigh, one calf, one ankle, and on the other leg, the calf, ankle, and the toe. We also see our device is able to do the 93922, which is the limited arterial study. This consists of just an ABI and ankle PVRs. It's a bit faster and gets reimbursed less. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have the 93924, which is our post-exercise study. This is the longest of the three tests because it is a full arterial study plus a post-exercise session where you exercise the patient for five minutes or until claudication pain occurs. And then you look at the rate at which their blood pressure 
returns to resting. So gets reimbursed the most, takes the longest, 93922 is faster, reimbursed less, 93923 is that happy middle. Now for offices that are sending their tests to be interpreted by an outside physician, they have to use the modifier TC for technical component on their final billings. For offices that are interpreting internally, they don't need to use a modifier because they're both responsible for the technical and interpretation. Briefly looking at the materials in your PadNet box, we should see some marketing materials going over some of the information about PAD discussed earlier. Those PadNet questionnaires we talked about, the, P the PadNet device and the HP 2-in-1 laptop, the PPG probe, which is the probe that's used during the blood pressure segments, and we'll talk about this a bit later. We'll also see a gray extension hose used to connect the PadNet device to each of your blood pressure cuffs. We'll have eight blood pressure cuffs that are blue, and those will be used for the arms and the calf. There'll be four cuffs labeled calf and arm. There'll be two cuffs labeled for above the knee. Those are interchangeable either left or right. And then you'll have two ankle cuffs interchangeable left and right. You'll also have two toe cuffs, and these are the most unique of any of the cuffs. These ones have a clear hose instead of an orange hose, and they have clear bladders instead of blue bladders. They're also smaller so that they can fit on the toes. When going over preparing patients for the test, there are a couple things we want to keep in mind. We want the cuffs to be able to have access to the skin, so we ask that patients come prepared with or that clinics have prepared loose, comfortable clothing that exposes the limbs. Patients can get tested in t-shirt and shorts, hospital scrubs, hospital gowns, even in their underwear. However, if you're testing your patient in their underwear, we encourage you to provide a blanket for both privacy and to keep the patient warm. We also want to make sure that our patient is lying flat. Now, the minimum criteria for this is that our arm pressure cuffs are at the same height as the ankle ones, so they can be slightly rec reclined, and of course you can give them a pillow when they're laying down, but we encourage patients to be lying flat. We also don't want to be affecting our heart rate when we're in analyzing it, so no alcohol, caffeine, or nicotine 30 minutes before the test. And lastly, for the full arterial study, we want to make sure that we're getting a genuine resting period result, and we're getting resting rates for the patient, so we encourage a brief rest period before starting the test. When putting on the cuffs, there are two things we want to consider. We want to make sure that the right side is against the skin. We want the bladder placed against the skin. There are a number of things that we do to help remind you which side is correct. We've labeled the inside as placed the side against the skin. Also, all text that goes on the inside is printed on the landscape way of looking at the cuff versus all text that goes on the outside is printed on the portrait way. We've also placed the biomedics logo as well as the cuff label on the outside. So when you've placed all your cuffs on the patient, you wanna make sure you can see that biomedics logo. Lastly, we follow standard Velcro manufacturing procedures and we have the hooks facing away from the skin and the fuzzy part facing towards the skin. We also wanna make sure that the cuffs are on tight enough for a number of reasons. One, we want them to be snug so that they get the most sensitive readings. And two, it cuts back on time because if they're loose, they have to inflate a great deal more in order to actually pick up the readings they're looking for. And then deflate, uh, deflation takes longer. So we wanna make sure the cuffs are tight enough that we cannot comfortably fit two fingers between the cuff and the skin. Now looking at the PPG probe, this is used during our pressure segments only. This is a light sensor that essentially acts as a visual stethoscope. We place it on the digit of whichever limb we are testing. So if we are looking at the right arm, we put it on the right middle finger. If we're looking at the left ankle, we put it on the left big toe. If we're looking at the right big toe, we put it on that right big toe. For the fingers, you want to place it right on the fingertip, sort of against the fingerprint. You want to make sure that the glass side, which is the light sensor, is being covered by as much surface area as possible so that no extraneous light is interfering. Now, there are a number of reasons why you might want to slide it lower down the finger. For example, if you have patients with calluses on their finger or a lot of finger scarring from finger pricks because of blood testing, that would be caused to move it lower on the finger. Similarly, if there's any kind of callus or irritation of the skin because of jewelry or Raynaud's finger pricking on the lower part of the finger, that'd be caused to move it up. In general, I say all other factors aside, a good default is to place it right on the fingerprint of the middle finger. For the big toe, similarly, you kind of put it you want to put it right on what's the equivalent toe print of the big toe and you want the wire running down towards the foot just like you see in the pictures similarly on the hand you want the wire running down towards the arm Now, a couple other services that we provide here at Biomedics, we work with the American College of Foot and Ankle Orthopedic Medicine to provide certificates for their trainers. Some states do require ACFOAM certification for certain tests. Not all states do. Training for these 
can be done in these one-on-one -on -one sessions to prepare you for a 30 question exam. After this training, you will have learned much of the information for that exam. You also get to receive an informational packet that has all of the content necessary to answer those questions and the test is open book. It's a 30 question multiple choice exam. And once you've passed, you submit 10 studies to us for evaluation within the first 30 days of passing your exam. We look at those tests for consistently strong testing practices. If we see consistently strong testing practices as well as a past exam, we pass along this information to the American College of Foot and Ankle Orthopedic Medicine. We generate a certificate for you. We mail it to you. A second service that we offer are chart reviews. We offer uh, chart reviews where we go into your EMR, your patient database. We extract data considering the ICD-10 codes affiliated with each patient, and we look at those ICD-10 codes and match them with risk factors and indications for PAD. We then return our results to you and hand you a pool of patients that have a lot of risk factors and many indications for PAD, saying you should probably look at these patients that we're already working with for PAD. And the last thing we offer is test shadowing. All of our trainers and anyone on our customer support team is able to shadow your test. You can call them at the number below or at the email below. And it's best if you schedule a shadowing so that we can make sure that someone is ready to call you when your patient is in the room. But essentially with a shadowing, we stay with you on the phone, we look at your computer, we make sure that we're helping you out with any troubleshooting errors or walking you through any uncertainties you have while conducting your full arterial study. And of course, for all other questions, you can contact our biomedic support team at 888-889-8997 or support at biomedics.com.